Hi everyone, Alex here. I'd just like to take a moment to thank some of our patrons. Jennifer Payton, Camilla Sutton, Charles Craig, Igor Nikolsky, Brianna, Cara Martin, Lauren Coleman, Wim, Shauna Bracken, Callie Shearer, Zalia Chimera, Christopher Niez, Maxwell Scrocky, Philip Platt, Aurora B, Johnny Dangerously, Athena Freyd, Lice Rojas, Iris, Kim Cuthbertson. Thank you all. We really appreciate your support. If you'd like to join them, go to www.patreon.com forward slash Rusty Quill and take a look at our rewards. Rusty Quill presents The Magnus Archives Episode 153 Love Bombing Statement of Barbara Mullen-Jones regarding her nine months spent with the Divine Chain Cult. Original statement given 2nd April 2012. Audio recording by Jonathan Sims, the archivist. Statement begins. Everyone thinks they're too smart to get involved in a cult. I'm sure you do. You think that at the first mention of aliens, or the end of the world, or the lost book of the Bible, where Jesus buried his holy staff in the foothills of the Himalayas, you'd go running. Trouble is, that misunderstands how it works. I mean, when I was with the Divine Chain, some of the smartest people there were also the most committed. Intelligence doesn't make you less prone to taking on bad ideas, it just makes you better at defending them. To other people, and to yourself. Smart people can believe some truly ridiculous things, and then deploy all the reason and logic at their disposal to justify them. Because belief doesn't begin in your mind. It begins in your feelings. And cults are very good at finding you when you're at your lowest point, when you're at your most emotionally vulnerable. And when you're at that point, it's astounding what can crawl into your heart and start to fester there. I hit my lowest point when I turned 41. That's when my life came crashing down, at least on the inside. From the outside, I'm sure everything looked pretty much okay. I was getting gigs, I had a job, I had plenty of friends and a supportive family. But that was when I started to properly look at my life, and I really didn't like what was looking back. I was a stand-up comedian, you see, and a really good one. That's not boasting, that's just the truth. And I'd always assumed that that was enough to eventually have real success. And for the first ten years, it seemed like I was right. I worked my way up, performed for basically nothing basically every night, and got to be pretty successful. And then I stayed that way for the next ten years. Trouble is, do you know how much a pretty successful comedian makes... Let's just say I had a full-time office job and was still barely making rent. But between working full-time and gigging full-time, I just kept putting off everything else in my life. Always so sure the big time was just around the corner. This is the TV spot that gets me noticed. This is the sell-out fringe show that makes me mainstream. This is the deal that actually goes somewhere. I made it through turning 40 with my self-image intact. But for some reason, at 41, I just cracked. I realised I'd spent most of my life with nothing to show for it but a few awards no one cares about, a string of awful comedian exes who broke up with me for being funnier than them, and a dreadful office job. I was going to be working until I died because I'd never bothered to build a stable career. I was never going to own a home, never going to have kids, 
never going to have the life I'd spent my entire youth sacrificing for. And yes, I know that 41 isn't actually too late for most of that, but try telling that to someone who's just decided they've wasted their life. I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone about it. My friends were all comedians who really didn't want to hear it, and my family were blandly supportive to the point of uselessness. Oh, they had plenty of soothing platitudes, but platitudes wouldn't get me back twenty years. I was in a really bad place. Then a friend recommended a meditation course to me, and I thought I'd give it a shot. Obviously, the meditation course didn't mention anything about the organisation behind it. I had no idea it was anything other than a standard evening class, and it had exactly the right level of pseudo-mystical nonsense to it to get me comfortable. A little bit of tarot imagery here, some misinterpretation of chakras there, a touch of sweet-smelling incense to tie it all together, and you have a meditation class that is exactly my level. I mean, let's put it like this. I don't believe in the power of crystals, but I still have plenty dotted around my bedroom. I don't believe in astrology, but I do have my birth chart on my wall, and like to change my horoscope, sun sign, and ascendant every day. Just for fun, of course. Anyway, the meditation part of it was actually really good. I'd never had much luck silencing my mind, but Joyce, the lady running it, was really good at bringing you to that space. It was surprisingly freeing. I started attending regularly. One thing she insisted on was that at the start of each session, we would all sit in a circle and tell the others what we liked about each other. Only compliments. Only truth. The first few sessions, no one really knew the others well enough to offer anything more than general niceties. But as it went on and we became closer, the affirmations became more personal. More meaningful. And it felt really good. Just to have all that positivity, that affection uncritically directed at you. I thought it would be cheesy. But it was just this incredible feeling of being wanted and appreciated. You know, every comedian goes on about how they love the business. How great everyone is. Every one of them is lying. It's horrible. And everyone in it is horrible. And being there. Having people be genuinely lovely to me. I didn't know what to do with those feelings. Apparently, in organisations that monitor cults, this method is called love bombing. I think I'd even heard of it somewhere before. But that didn't make it any less effective. I went to the meditation group for about three months before Joyce mentioned a spiritual retreat she wanted us all to go on. It was in America, a small community out in rural Arkansas, and all our expenses would be taken care of. That should have sent alarm bells ringing, but... By that point, I trusted her so implicitly that I was just excited I wouldn't have to buy my own ticket. I won't bore you with the details of the rest of my indoctrination once I got to the Divine Chains community, or compound, to use the classic term, though there weren't any fences or watchtowers. Suffice to say that there was more friendliness, support, meditation, and, you know what? Really good food. I'm told that Arnold used to be a chef before they recruited him, and well, it very much helped their cause. I also met the leader of the organisation, Claude Villacazzi. And he was so... nice. People talk about charismatic dictators or cults of personality, but honestly, you don't even know what charisma is until you meet someone like Claude. Everything you say is valid and important. You are always worthy of his time, and... you know what? Deep down, you just think the same way. I mean, even now, after everything, I still miss listening to him talk. The Divine Chain's philosophy was pretty simple. Throughout history, there had been ten great links, holy figures of divine wisdom, who were the manifested will of humanity to understand and better itself. All the heavy hitters you'd expect were on the list. Uh, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Ramakrishna, y you get the idea. They weren't reincarnations per se, but the same divine impulse for human elevation manifested in different people. Claude Villacazzi was definitely not claiming to be the eleventh link, oh no. But he had had a vision that the eleventh was soon to be born, and that he was to be their herald and guardian. 
The actual practices were a grab bag of all sorts of occultism, exactly what you'd expect from a group who laid claim to basically every major religion. Honestly, I don't know how much I actually believed any of it, but I felt like I belonged there. I sold what little I had in order to fully earn my place in the community, and I stayed. I had shelter, food, all the companionship I could ask for. I spent my days working in the field. We actually produced one of the only American brands of rice wine, which was how the cult made most of its money. And it felt good to be working with my hands. When the whole thing collapsed, the papers made all sorts of awful claims about the place, but I don't know if they were wholly made up or if they happened the whole time and I just didn't notice. Or if they came about after things started to change, started to go rotten. I wasn't there when they found the dog. Maybe if I had been, things would have been different. It was actually Joyce and a few others who stumbled across it while working the fields. The way they told it, it was thin and emaciated, barely able to walk and clearly suffering from some sort of sickness. But there was something in it that drew them closer. As Joyce put it, we couldn't help but love it. They took it to Claude, who was just as taken with the thing, and decided to adopt it. He named the dog Agape in front of everyone, and took it into his private room to be cared for. That was the last I saw of the thing, and honestly, I kind of forgot about it for the next few weeks. But that was the moment when things started to get really weird. Claude announced at evening meal a few days later that he had been dreaming of the 11th, and there were going to be some changes to help spiritually prepare us for their arrival. We needed to achieve a state of pure love. And to begin with, what that meant was that whenever we would meet one another or pass each other in the corridor or fields, we would tell each other that we loved them. And, Claude said solemnly, you have to mean it. At the time, it didn't seem so sinister, and we all began to do it without question. Until a week later when I bumped into Mary outside the showers. I told her I loved her and began to walk on when her arm shot out and grabbed me by the shoulder. She spun me to face her and looked me dead in the eye. I don't believe you, she said. I mean, she was right. She and I had never really got on. Just two different personalities. But in that moment, I was suddenly terrified of what might happen if she thought I was lying about it. So I said it again, and I tried very hard to mean it. Her eyes bored into me, and I noticed that they were yellow and sickly, like she had really bad jaundice. Then she nodded once, turned, and left. It was about that time that the rice wine started to go bad. Every batch we brewed came out cloudy and undrinkable. We couldn't figure out what was going on. I spent so long cleaning every piece of equipment over and over again, but it just kept happening. When we raised it with Claude or any of the others in the inner circle, they would nod understandingly, then tell us it didn't matter. That it was no longer our concern now that the 11th was so close. All the others seemed to accept this without question, and I didn't feel like I could press the matter without drawing negative attention, something I was desperate to avoid doing. So I just sat there, as it grew bitter, cloudy, and rancid. Nobody bothered to get rid of the wine, and the smell gradually began to permeate through the building. Those closest to Claude began to change as well. Everyone in the community had always been very touchy-feely, but now it seemed like they were always touching each other, or holding hands, or in some way pressing their skin to each other even at meal times or in situations where it seemed really awkward. A few times they touched me or hugged me or shook my hand, and each time I could feel myself struggling not to recoil. They'd stare at me with their yellowing eyes and their skin was dry and somehow sticky. When I pressed it, it yielded ever so slightly like there wasn't anything solid inside. Even then I didn't think to leave. 
I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I trusted Claude so completely, I couldn't imagine it was truly harmful. Then came the day when he announced that the 11th had arrived. I expected cheers, excitement, but instead there were just murmurings of resolve and determination as though a difficult task lay ahead. Claude asked who was going to be the first to meet them. Everyone went quiet, awed by the sudden opportunity for divine benediction. He walked up and gently touched Joyce on the cheek and she smiled with a happiness more pure than I'd ever seen on a human face. We formed into a long line, a chain holding hands with Joyce at the very end of it. It stretched from one end of the building to the other. I was at the other end, so didn't see what happened when she walked into Claude's private chambers. But as she did, something passed down the line. I don't know how to describe it, really. Did you ever do that experiment in science class, where you held hands in a line and the teacher passed a very gentle electric shock down through the students? That feeling of a charge going through you. It was like that. But what passed through us was warm and slick and seemed to flow through my body like oil and out into the ground. Everyone felt it. And their blissful smiles made me feel even more nauseated than the sensation itself. I never saw Joyce again. Each day, after evening meal, Claude chose someone else to meet the eleventh. Each time the same process, the same daisy chaining of hands, me at the end, the same sick feeling sliding through me, another member of the community gone, the line getting shorter. A fear fell over the others, and at first I thought it was the same fear that I had. But when I'd heard them talk of it, what they feared was that they wouldn't get chosen. That somehow this chance for pure divine love would pass them by. And I suddenly came to the realization that perhaps I didn't belong here like I thought I did. So one night I decided to see for myself. I waited until after lights out, then slipped from the dormitory, through the empty corridors towards Claude's private rooms. The moon was bright through the window, casting everything in stark, pale shadow. As I got closer, I began to smell it. It wasn't rancid, not like the wine, but sweet, like overripe fruit or sugar that's cooked too long. I found myself standing in front of the understated wooden door that I'd now seen almost a dozen people disappear into. My hand reached slowly for the handle when I heard someone moving behind it. No, it wasn't someone moving, it was many people, I'm sure of it. The sounds of dozens of limbs moving and stepping and shuffling in unison. Then laughter then weeping, then movement again. I looked down at my shaking hand and saw that seeping under the door was something slick and colourless, a greasy residue that smelled overpoweringly of that sickly sweet odour. I took a step back, suddenly nauseated, and almost fell into the arms of Claude, who had silently come up behind me. He held me for a moment, looking with such intensity that I felt like he was weighing my soul, his expression unreadable. Then he sighed and shook his head. You do not belong here. You are not worthy of its love. Leave. Even after everything I'd seen, I can't tell you how deeply those words hurt me. I turned and I ran out of the building, out of the compound, out into the night. I ran until I reached a road, then sat there shaking until a passing car took pity on me and took me down to the local sheriff's office. 
Eventually my case got passed up the line. Apparently a few different government agencies were interested in the divine chain, mainly for possible tax fraud, and my testimony was pretty much exactly what they needed to go in there and check it out. They didn't tell me what they found until after I'd had a few sessions with a psychiatrist who specialised in cult deprogramming. And I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to find out most of the details online. I'm pretty sure it made national news. There is one thing, however, that I think they lied about. The reports detailed a mass grave in the rooms of Claude Villacazzi, with bodies mutilated and mixed together, some who'd been dead for weeks. But I don't believe that. Whatever was in that room, I am absolutely sure that when the authorities arrived, it was still alive. I just don't know what alive means when it comes to something like that. It doesn't matter, though. The compound was destroyed in an accidental generator explosion, and everything was gone. There's a part of me that's glad. A sick little part that's happy that whatever love was there, whatever I couldn't be a part of, is gone from the world. And no one else gets it either. Statement ends. I swear, I almost find the cult dedicated to the dark powers of fear easier to understand than the more mundane sort. At least they have some consistency. This, well, the corruption at work, if I had to guess, though with unsettling echoes of uh, fleshliness. I suppose I... Wait. Oh, uh... <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think, um, I think you should probably get down here. Hello, lad. You miss us. I... Sit yeah. down. Well, we check if you're still human enough to bleed. <laughs> You've got something of ours. Someone. Took him right from under our noses. In our own house. Oh, I call that rude, don't you? Jerry wasn't yours. You had no oh, right to... You hear that, Julia? Jerry. Sounds like you've got pretty chummy. Where is he? Gone. What do you mean, gone? I can ask you again, son. I burned the page. Released him. On that right noble of you. Proper humanitarian. So... Let me get this straight. We take you in, protect you from the thing that's hunting you. Spare your life, even though you're no better. Help you, give you access to one of our most valuable resources, and you steal it from us. Piss off back to England, and then burn it. That's just inconsiderate. He asked me to. Oh, really? You always do what evil books tell you to, do you? Gotta say, I'm disappointed genuinely thought you were different but you're just another monster not even worth the chase you want the honours old man don't mind if I do <laughs> get away from him oh. what's this you got yourself a watchdog well more of a lapdog scrawny isn't she I said get back Malnourished, I'd say. How long since you last tasted blood? You think you can take us both? I'd enjoy it. Start with the old bastard. He's slower, doesn't guard his neck. And you worry about him too much, don't you? I go for him, you get sloppy. Predictable. Sure. Or I slit your little bookworm's throat. Do it. And give me a chance to finish off your dad. I'm not her father. Not by blood, maybe. Shut it! Come on, Julia. What? There's no rush. We've got all the time in the world. Besides, this place is just full of monsters. She can't guard them all. Fine. <sighs> Thank you. I, I don't know. Daisy! Oh. Are you alright? Don't touch me. Christ, he was right. I, I didn't... When did you get so I'm thin? I'm not. It's fine. It's the hunt, isn't it? Without it... I'm fine. Just haven't been hungry. 
hope I'm strong enough. Clearly. They're not gone yet. We could still get them. Daisy, no. It's like you say. Don't listen to the blood. Listen to the quiet. Even so, if it's having this much of an effect on I'm you... I'm not going back. I can't let it in again. But it... What if it kills you? <laughs> Always said I was dedicated to justice. Daisy, it's not... You can't think like that. John, do you have any idea how much damage you can do if you're a police officer who wants to hurt people? How much the system will protect you? I managed to keep most of it from Basira, but... That this... wasn't you, that was the hunt. We were the same. You'd never known anything different? Because I never wanted to. Well, that time trap was good for one thing. Thinking. And I did a lot of it. I've made my choice. Okay. So what do we do when they come back? I don't know. Come on. <laughs> We'd better talk to Sarah. The Magnus Archives is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Today's episode was written by Jonathan Sims and directed by Alexander J. Newell. To subscribe, view associated material, or join our Patreon, visit RustyQuill.com. Rate and review us online, tweet us at the Rusty Quill. Visit us on Facebook or email us at mail at rustyquill.com. Join our communities on the forum via the website or on Reddit at r slash the Magnus Archives. Thanks for listening.